At this point, with the opportunity to be here, it is important that we invite the Almighty Allah to be in our midst to steer the affairs of this program. And so I would like to invite for a Christian prayer and a Muslim prayer. The Christian prayer will be said first. It will be immediately followed by a Muslim prayer. And so I'd like to invite Reverend Ekua Oforibwating from the Holy Trinity Cathedral, Accra. She is an engineer as well. A round of applause for her, please. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Let us bow our heads and pray. Almighty and eternal God, you have revealed your glory to all nations. You are the God of power and might, wisdom and justice, and through you all authority is rightly administered. All laws are enacted and judgment is decreed. Let the light of your divine wisdom direct the deliberations of this Congress, and especially the service of your handmaid, Professor J. Nana Opuku Ajima. Assist her with your spirit of counsel and fortitude. Make her work to be conducted in righteousness and to be eminently useful to all Ghanaians. And may she encourage due respect for virtue and religion amongst all of us. Through your mercy and your grace, may she and His Excellency John Dramani Mahama execute this campaign within all the laws of this country, and may they be enabled by your powerful protection to discharge their duties with honesty and ability. Shine forth, Father, in all the proceedings of this evening and the upcoming campaign. May this party seek to preserve peace promote liberty, and ensure equality for all Ghanaians. And for all of us, may we be preserved in the peace which the world cannot give. We ask this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in unity with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thank you very much, Reverend Engineer Kriyo Furibwate from the Holy Trinity Cathedral. We now invite Sheikh Imam Abdullah Shaibu, who is the Medina Municipal Chief Imam, to also give us a Muslim prayer. Assalamu alaikum. ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته إني أنا ما بقى بيارا مدبكو أكان نمو أنو بيه كتر أمامي إني أنا ما أنسى ينجنا ينفع ينبتي أنفع من ينكفى ما أو بسرعة أساسي Ujian jina ho, yang faham buta yang faham yang kukom, yang suni yang bangga, jadi kira aman ono, orang jisoh orang jisoh mayan. Right, of course, uh, prayers being rendered there before the main event begins. But this is your election headquarters. We're live on Joy ninety nine point seven FM. Of course, this is the Joy News Channel and. Evans Mensa has done some analysis of the John and Jane ticket as we try to solve the puzzle. We're joined by Winston Amwa, uh, and uh, later, I believe, we'll be uh, having um, 
MFA Apple, strong voice on our team, joining us uh, for this analysis. But as we try to break down some of these issues, it's become clear that this is not a cut and dried issue. Mm. Clearly, analysis can take you in one direction or the other. But in the end, one thing we all agree on is that it's a popularity contest. Winston, you had an intervention just before yes. we took a break. You know, I was going to say that, see, uh, Evans makes a fantastic point. Four months to an election, maybe five months, you say, man, come on, you don't have time. But, if, but there's one thing opposition does to political parties. My guy, opposition is hell, like Ekwesi Gabra said. <laughs> and if there's one place where political parties bury all differences and seek to capture power, it's when they are in opposition. So, let me tell you this. Um, in 2008, um, John Mahama himself was selected as running with about six months to the elections. Yeah. In 2000, same with Jay for selecting Ali Mahama. But they were able to win the elections. We can give other examples. My point simply is this. Five months to an election is such a short time mm. for Nana, it may be, to make an impact. But it could also be such a good time to effectively market her and put her out as the person. Because sometimes also, the more you last on the campaign platform, the more you make mistakes and the more people get angry with you. Right. So the shorter could be better, mm. okay? I mean, yes, I mean in, 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 in the case of Bamiya, it worked for him. He had been uh, running it for a very long time. It worked for him. He was all over the place giving lectures. But I said something on radio when Nana was selected. And I'll say this briefly. When I went to the University of Cape Coast, she was then Dean of Graduate Studies. As a lecturer for African women writers at the time, there was one thing she had always said, uh, I don't know whether to repeat it, but she said, why is it that when we, you introduce men, you don't ask, add, add that they are married with children and what have you? Mm. But when it comes to women, you do that all the time. So in 2006, I was supposed to introduce her at a program. I went to her and I said, Prof, this is how I'd like to introduce you. She's okay, and I said, don't worry. I would not add that you are married with children. Then she laughed and said, oh, you know, I would tease you if you do that. It left a lasting impression because contrary to how she was perceived as, I mean, all this iron lady, very principled, she doesn't really laugh and all of that. Mm. That particular encounter with her taught me one thing. Sometimes there are people when you get close to, they leave a lasting impression on you. I have quoted the days to this because it left that lasting impression on my mind. Mm. I'm sure I've come across a lot of lectures and I can't remember the things that we did. So, so but, I guess but I can remember this. That she knows she how leaves to an impression, right? She leaves an impression. When she knows how to connect. Yes, she leaves an impression when you get close to her. I tell right. you what, she leaves an impression. Let's throw a curveball into this matter because there is a curveball mm. for the 2020 election. And it is historic, COVID-19. Mm. It affects how we campaign. It affects how we go around the country and try to uh, you know, gather, garner the masses. Mm. How exactly does the John and Jane ticket stand the NDC? In, in, you know, in good stead, going into a, an election that might have to rely more on technology than any election before it. I think they should bring back the ghost of Professor Mills. Pardon? Yeah. Go to 2008 and go back to door to door. Just JM, take one part of the country. J Nana Pokwajiman, take the other part of the country. Walk, knock on doors small team of people, core team. I remember when I followed Professor Meltz, um, it was myself, I mean, a small team of media men because we had attached to him to follow him across the country, and a small team of NDC folks. So there is the man himself, Doris Koku, and also a small other group of people, well, not five people, right? And the media followed him. He went knocking on doors. COVID-19 doesn't allow you to gather people to do mass rallies, etc. But if you go into people's homes, it's, it's suited to the climate now than ever before. You can simply walk in somebody's home, just three, four people, knock on your door. Can you imagine JM knocking on people's doors, Professor Jaina Nopokojiman going to marketplaces, knocking on places where, you know, you know the women folks are there. And I must argue, she must do something from the playbook of, um, um, uh, Rawlings's wife. Um, Nana Kundu Nana Kundu Wow. Of, in all, terms, of all the playbooks it, to follow. It, exactly. In terms of the way she galvanized market women in the 31st Decimal Women's Movement mm. to help Mr. Rawlings in 1992, 1996. 
Now, that was so important. Remember that her base in KEEA, one of the things she's done already is that she's a patron of the market room in there. Mm. So she has some experience doing this. It's the reason why when she did the first outdooring, they brought in the, um, the oh, yeah, yeah. headquarters to her. Mm. So I'm saying, within COVID-19, they should bring back the ghost of Professor Mills. And it was just two days ago, last Friday, right? Mm, yeah. That he celebrated his passing. Mm. They need to go back to doing that. Because again, that is what the mass base of the party loves. The man who is coming into our hood to speak to us, we see him. 2016, they said they didn't see JM because there was a disconnection. Centralized campaign, totally disconnected from the mass base of the party in the regions, in the wards, in the polling uh, stations, etc. This is the time to do door to door because COVID 19 doesn't allow you anyway to do all these big rallies, etc., and pump money into it. Wow. So to me, that's my answer to you. Have we finally found something that the head and his deputy can agree on? Uh, I think I'd agree with you. Oh, wow. oh, look at that. Look at that. Oh, I feel like Kofi uh, yeah, Annan well. in here. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yes. Uh, look, you don't have lots of choices around this time. And if there's one thing that has taught us since 2000 and, um, you know, uh, eight, how to win an election because Akufa also implemented a similar strategy in 2016. Yeah. You know, when he was going around, he did his uh, listening tour, he did a lot of things. Oh, and the Kalipo. And the, yeah, Kalipo. And you, you saw, the Kalipo? Yeah, mm -hmm. and you saw, I mean, the Kalipo yeah. challenge. Yeah. You saw, that was quite yeah. a thing. I mean, I mean, and you saw an Akufa going to places, eating with people, and all of that. I mean, so with a lot of options not, not available to them, I think one thing that becomes acceptable under the circumstance. It's doing a door-to-door -door campaign. Mm. By that way, you're connecting to the people. Uh, you might still want to have a few uh, policy dialogues, uh, bring out your best of policies, let people debate it. Uh, whoever puts out those policies must be prepared to defend them. If you defend them very well, mm. but having said that, also, I, I, I just have to say that the managers of Nano Pokwajiman should be careful not to get her to throw too many jabs. It wow. could prove suicidal. Okay. Well, we'll find out why. Uh, Winston thinks so, but first let's go and listen to a few goodwill messages, I believe, which are being played um, at the event grounds right now. Office at the National Council for Tertiary Education, NCT, in October 2010. And by virtue of that position, I became a member of the Council of the University of Cape Coast when she was the Vice Chancellor then. You will see at meetings that she was somebody who was a good listener. Not overly defensive of her stand because at council meetings, you would, well, she listened very well to anything that council was suggesting. And if it was something not acceptable, the way she defended it was very good in the sense that uh, it did show respect and she tried to show the reason behind her decision. One other thing I think worth mentioning is that she's one that I can say values relations. When she builds them, I would say as far as I know, she tries to keep them. The final thing I would want to say about her, which was a pleasant surprise to me, is that I come from a village right at the border of Ghana on top, Golu. I was surprised when she told me that she's a daughter of Golu. I said, what do you mean by that? And I did check. Long before she became a minister and vice chancellor, she used to go all that way to with people, students, on, uh, I understand about tourism, she did work there, and the war that we have around the village, she was interested in it as one that has a great tourism potential. Another aspect was her compassion or passion for women's empowerment. She was working with the chief and trying to get the women together to have a share nut processing uh, factory, which I understand had they had done quite a lot and even acquired some equipment. For me, when I heard that she was nominated as a vice presidential candidate, I thought that was a very good choice indeed. She brings a lot to the ticket 
And if I have to describe her in a few words, I would say one that is compassionate. I have uh, experienced it. She values her relations with people. That's one. She's a consensus builder. This is also another. And finally, her love for women's empowerment, demonstrated by what she has done in my village. And I would also say the rural folk, typified by my village. Just look at the distance from Cape Coast to Golu, and you will understand what I mean. This is something that you would want everybody in that position to have. I have experienced all these things personally with her, and I think that she's a good choice, excellent choice indeed. I welcome the opportunity to congratulate uh, Professor. All right, so indeed, it's an excellent choice, and we uh, are here to outdoor and celebrate that choice. I have the pleasure now to invite the administrator of the NDC, the secretary, the general secretary of the great NDC, the only general in Ghana's politics, General Mosquito. Good evening to you all, ladies and gentlemen, and good evening to our compatriots in Ghana, or whatever it may be, to the millions of viewers across the world. We are gathered here at the auditorium of the University of Professional Studies, Accra, Ghana, for the purpose of adoring the vice presidential candidate of our great National Democratic Congress Party. This event marks a very significant milestone in our journey towards rescuing our nation from maladministration. Even as this event takes place, there is another very important exercise that is ongoing in the country, and that is the registration of voters to participate in the December elections. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the rank and file of our great party for the vigilance and enthusiasm they have shown so far in the conduct of the exercise. Particularly, we are most grateful to our IT directorates and the election directorates for vigilantly assisting us to detect fraudulent activities that had been perpetrated in the conduct of the exercise. Let me thank the youth of Ghana who have risen to the occasion and have shown determination to make a change in their governance and their circumstances. Indeed, most of the work of monitoring the exercise has been with the collective effort of our compatriots in the nooks and crannies of the country, be they NDC or not, to ensure that the right things are done 
and our right for self-determination is not compromised. Let me take this opportunity to also thank members and personnel of the security services for the work so far done. Those who have shown sufficient nationalism and professionalism in helping to keep vigilantism at bay. Let me also advise a few of the errant security personnel who on some occasions have chosen to be partisan. I like to remind them that any time there is any temptation for them to obey unlawful instructions, they should remove their berets, look at the crown on it, and remind themselves that their duty is to serve the nation Ghana and not any political party. <laughs> Finally, I have heard it being said that what magic is Nana bringing to the table? Or what new is President Mahama bringing to the table? My answer has been very simple. That the magic is with you, the rank and file of the National Democratic Congress, and the magic is in the youth of Ghana who are dissatisfied and disillusioned with what is happening. And the magic is simply unity. If we are united and determined to make a change in our circumstances, it shall be. But we cannot win election with a divided front. So I'd like to urge everybody who wants to see a change to let us close our ranks. As an organization, decisions may be taken anyway. And it is not possible for decisions to be taken that satisfies everybody. What is important is that the decisions must satisfy the greatest number of our party members. And so after a decision has been taken, our duty is to close our ranks, rally around our leadership, and make sure that the mission of rescuing Ghana is accomplished. This is the time for party members to collectively take ownership of the future John Mahama government. If we all sit aside and expect that President Mahama and Jane would have some magic to perform to bring us to power. Eventually, when the power comes, the government is going to be John Mahama and Jane's government. But if we get our hands and put our shoulders to the wheel, whether we are identified for praise or not, and we do the little bit we can in our various corners, the government that will emerge will truly be an NDC government. Thank you very much, and may God bless our homeland Ghana. Yes, that's a macho mosquito right there. Another round of applause for the general making the rallying call to the troops to collectively put their shoulders behind the wheel and make it possible together in rescuing this country from 
the hands of people who simply have no clue as to how to take us to a better place as a people. Once again, on behalf of the flag bearer, on behalf of the national chairman and the general secretary, I wish to send our sincere apologies to the thousands and millions of our members out there who would have loved to be part of today's event, especially at the UPSA Africa. Unfortunately, due to COVID restrictions, we have had to uh, inconvenience ourselves by reducing the numbers to hold this event. We apologize to you all for not having the opportunity to be here with us, but we are grateful that you are monitoring across the world on various television networks, on radio stations, and also online. It's my pleasure now to invite the national chairman. He's a preacher as well. Honorable Ampofo, Samuel Ofosu Ampofo, to the podium to also address us this evening. A round of applause, of applause for our chairman. Thank you. on the Joy News channel and of course on Joy 99.7 FM. Uh, we're coming to you with a live event from UPSA. Uh, it's currently being addressed by the chairman of the NDC. They are soon to unveil their running mate, Professor Nana Jeno Fukuajiman. Let's hear what the chairman has to say to the gathered uh, 100 or so dignitaries. President of the Republic of Ghana and our soon to be adult running mate. Alhaji Muhammad Idrisu, the Vice Chairman of the Council of Elders of our party, General Secretary of our party, Right Honorable Dua Jaho, former Speaker of Parliament, Honorable Harun Idrisu, Minority Leader and Honorable Members of Parliament here present, Professor Joshua Labi, National Campaign Manager, NEC and FEC members, Regional Chairman here present, distinguished members of the clergy, Nanam Nom, our friends from the media, fellow Akatamansonians. Today is a very special day in the life of our country and our party, the NDC. Today, the leader and flag bearer of our great National Democratic Congress is together with the party adoring the person who shall partner him as we enter the critical curve in the campaign to unseat the underperforming Akufuado government in the general election scheduled to take place in December this year. In other words, we are about to adore the next Vice President of the Republic of Ghana, God willing, when we win the 2020 election. This has been long in coming, but in the collective view of the able leadership of the NDC, this is the appropriate time to carry out this exercise, coming, as it were, after the MPP, our closest rivals, have announced their flag bearer and running mate last month. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we are here today as a result of a carefully crafted steps that started in the internal election to various party positions in the year 2018. The election of a flag bearer in the early last year, 20, in the early last year 2019 and the selection of most of our parliamentary candidates in the upcoming elections. The selection of a random meet completes the whole process, and it is therefore the icing on the cake in getting our human resource battle ready for the 2020 elections. In coming to the choice of a random meet, I can tell you in my capacity as national chairman that it hasn't been a difficult, it has been a difficult but pleasant task. For in the NDC, there are very many bright stars, suitable and qualified 
to be chosen to the position of running mate. Unfortunately, however, the 1992 constitution permits the flag bearer to select only one person to partner him or her in the presidential elections. It is in exercise of this mandate that the mantle of choice has fallen on our own illustrious Professor Jane Nana Ufuku Ajiman. And what a choice that the incoming president of Ghana has made. The National Democratic Congress is indeed extremely proud of its core social democratic credentials in which the power of state is used to create equal and favorable opportunities for all without any discrimination whatsoever. When the NDC says all, the NDC means all. This is because in the, in the politics and credo of the NDC, all Ghanaians are equal. This has been amply demonstrated in our short history since 1992. It is the NDC as a political party that for the first time appointed a speaker for Ghana's parliament as a woman. We are extremely proud of the legacy of Right Honorable Mrs. Joyce Bamford Addo, who served as the first female speaker of Ghana parliament, the third highest office in Ghana from 2009 to 2013. We wish her a well-deserved rest and God bountiful blessings in her retirement. The NDC is also on record to have appointed the first woman as the chairperson of the Council of State in the person of Honorable Cecilia Johnson. Again, it is the NDC as a party with the capacity to win elections that has set a new record in selecting a woman who will occupy the second highest position in the political administration of this country under the 1992 constitution on NDC winning the 2020 election. And that choice, the incoming president of Ghana has made. In the NDC, we never stop setting the pace for inclusiveness and gender mainstreaming. In the NDC, inclusiveness is our strongest identity, and we have no apologies for that. All of us have mothers. All of us are keenly aware of the wonderful life-saving contributions of the uncountable women of wealth and purpose in this country. We adore and honor our women, not in the form of mere tokenism, as others see it, but because in the NDC, we know that men and women do not only complement each other, but that given the opportunity, women can do as much as men in achieving progress for this country. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is the light of this that according to Article 43 of our party constitution, the revered Council of Elders and the National Executive Committee overwhelmingly endorse the selection of the woman that our politically astute flag bearer has chosen to enter the seat of government with, to execute the life transforming agenda of the National Democratic Congress, the rescue mission. Indeed, Ghana deserves better. Who is this woman? Professor Jenana Upokwajman comes with her own sterling accomplishment. And in the several years that she has been a public, in public service, many of our countrymen and women can attest to her efficiency, her effectiveness, her broad and deep knowledge of the affairs of society, her total command of a language that inspires, a language that binds, a language that assures and reassures, and a language that uplifts us to achieve beyond the ordinary and the mundane. In addition, she is a woman of integrity. <laughs> and one that I can state without fear of any contradiction, that she is totally worthy of the role that our eminent flag bearer and the party have assigned to her. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this event 
would have been patronized by our teeming supporters, such that the very foundation of this country would have been shaken. But because of the restrictions imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic, we are compelled to outdoor our vice presidential candidate in this manner. I'm however fortified in the belief that the elaborate arrangement put in by the party and the organizers of this evening event would afford a considerable number of our compatriots to appreciate who, in our collective wisdom, very much qualified to occupy the high office of the Vice President of the Republic of Ghana. The NDC party is optimistic that the John and Jane ticket is a winning pair of hands, the safest pair of hands that we can entrust the future of this country to. The rescue mission continues, and we shall not waver until victory becomes ours. Thank you, and God bless us all. Was the national chairman addressing uh, the gathered dignitaries at the unveiling, the official unveiling of the running mate to John Mahama? Very soon, Professor Nana Jino Pukwajima will deliver a very first uh, policy statement. And uh, everybody awaits with bated breath which tone she will set with this very first address. You can see social distancing being. Uh, Pretty strictly observed. Uh, everybody we see has a face covering. Uh, the suggestion here is that only a limited number of people were invited, and uh, the, the atmosphere is being controlled so that there is as uh, much social distancing as possible. We have the media up on a dais in the back so they can capture the images, and uh, we await the address of Professor Nana Jane Upuku Ajiman. Of course, we will be hearing from some notable members of the party before that address is delivered. But uh, we thank you very much for staying with us live on Joy 99.7 FM and, of course, right here on the Joy News Channel. This is your election headquarters. There's no other place to receive up-to-date, up-to-the-minute information on Ghana's election 2020. We bring it all to you in its glory. And right now, that glory is coming from UPSA's main auditorium, where Professor Nana Jinu Pukwajiman is soon to deliver her maiden policy statement. Many notable people in the audience, uh, from Professor Joshua Alabi to uh, Madame Marietta Bruapia Opong, uh, uh, Julius Debra, and uh, several other well-known NDC dignitaries, all in their masks, making it uh, a bit of a challenge to identify some of them, but that could be your pastime as you await the main address. Spot the NDC member. Of course, uh, it's all being compared by uh, Al Hassan Suhini, uh, who is about to uh, introduce the next stage of today, tonight's event live from the UPSA main auditorium. And joining us via Zoom. So let's take it from the base headquarters. Let's take it from the base headquarters quickly with the sound on. Zoom uh, and um, technology, of course, comes with its own hiccups. And this is likely to be a familiar sight in this uh, 2020 campaign for both parties as uh, we all attempt to leverage um, technology to the best of our ability with this pandemic still raging. Uh, of course, Evans and Winston are still with me. Uh, we'll be joined by MFR Pearl shortly. Uh, but Evans, fascinating events so far. We've heard from General Mosquito. We've heard from Samuel Fusompo for the chairman. And uh, some interesting sentiments shared there. But they're all seeking to set the tone uh, in anticipation of this maiden uh, address. Yeah, I mean, I, the, the most fascinating for me 
happens to be uh, General Mosquito's, uh, General Secretary of the Party's um, speech. Um, he sort of gave, uh, you, you, he didn't quite say what he was referring to, mm. but he talks about a certain decision that people may disagree with in the party, and that um, the most important thing is that, yeah, I mean, after the decision had been made, you may disagree with that position, but we must unite, the party must unite behind the decision um, and rally behind John Mahama and deliver uh, to deliver victory for the party. Mm. I mean, that got me, got me very curious. I'm just wondering, I mean, because we've had a lot of rumors that when um, John Mahama, um, you know, put forward the name of Jay Nano Pokwajiman, many of the party bigwigs were unhappy with that particular mm. um, name because they, had, they thought there were others who possibly could do the job better than hair. And so to hear him say, and of course we also heard, well, he was all one of those who before this in Absolutely. interviews had been asked whether, he and he said, yeah, he was interested in the position. Mm. So to hear him say that, you know, people in the party may be, you know, dissatisfied with the, you know, with a decision. Let me say what decision was. I'm just assuming mm. that possibly it may be that. And that the most important thing is unite around it. Get, it sort of almost confirms if that is what he was referring to, that that was indeed true. But could you, you have spoken to somebody a, a founder of the party. Indeed. And I'm, this is a teaser, I guess. Mm. Who sort of confirms that apparently people didn't... Absolutely. Jane wasn't the choice. We will be bringing that full interview tomorrow on the Super Morning Show and the AM Show uh, on the Joy News Channel and on Joy 99.7 FM. So we, uh, it, it, it is fascinating to dis discover that somebody of the caliber of the person I spoke to today, uh, interview of which will be played back tomorrow, um, also said that... Professor Nana Jino Pukwajima was not her choice. Was that, his choice. that was not his choice. Yeah. And that will surprise a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, it will. Come giving as a shock giving for a lot of the individual yes, who you've spoken to. Yes, and, and this is on record, by the way. Absolutely. So he this said is this on record. That... Yeah. Uh, and and you, you actually now you, you circle back to an important point that indeed this choice has thrown a lot of people for six. The question is whether or not it has thrown their opponents, the NPP, for six. Mm. Is the NPP rallying? Are they confused? Mm. Do they know how to respond mm. to Professor Nana Jino Puku Ajiman? No. Will it be difficult? No. Or are they already formulating you, uh, a You counter? raise a very important uh, point, Kujo. And tonight, as we've been speaking, the NPP is also fighting back. Sort mm. of, they don't want to see the space of the N N NDC alone. And so we've seen... Quickly, in the last few minutes, uh, flyers circulating with a hashtag, hashtag, it is him, not her, which has been quite aggressively pushed by the MPP, mm. you know, sympathizers and party activists. So they're seeking to refocus on John Mahama, take the focus off Professor Jane Opoku Ajiman and put it on John Mahama. And John Mahama. I mean, so th that, that, is, that is an interesting strategy, you know. I mean, mm. so the, the point you're making is, yeah, it's not about the running mate. Mm. It is about the, the man whose face is going to be on a ticket. And, and if you look at the posters that they've, they're sharing around, mm. they are cataloging some of John Muhammad's weaknesses or what they believe to be John Muhammad's weaknesses in 2016 right. when he was the, in government as a president. They, for example, I see one that says he created doom sort to head Ghanaians and Ghanaian businesses and then turn around to sign... Uh, allegedly fraudulent mm. deals that he benefited from. And then they say, hashtag, it's him, not her. Now, mm. the question to ask is, is the NPP, by this, admitting that Jane is a solid choice and we can't touch her? Mm. And, so, and so don't, don't, don't focus on her. I mean, mm. let's try and move the focus on John Mahama. It's, it's a very interesting dynamic, um, you know, of course, to... To, hmm. to explore. Fascinating. But I've got to say, what this, what this implies, if indeed uh, they are trying to refocus the attention on uh, John Mahama, uh, then it does signify that there is something of concern uh, on the part of the NPP in the choice of Professor Nana Jino Pukwajiman. They must see some manner of threat if they are indeed interested in refocusing the attention on um, on the, the, the flag bearer himself. But I wonder what that, what that fear would be. What exactly is the NPP afraid of mm -hmm. when it well, comes to Professor see, 
No, not Jane Ofo Kwajiman. Kucho, in, in, in every election, your propaganda mustn't be anything new. Your propaganda must be things that we know already. And so if you're talking to all of us, you must say the things that we already know so we can connect with you, so we can have a better understanding of uh, what you mean. And so if the NPP would have it easy, it should be re-echoing some of the things that people can readily recall, some of the things that people already know. And what are those things that people know? It's John Mahama. Hmm. It's John Mahama. So if hmm. you want to do that and do it very well, if you're going to make any impact with that sort of propaganda, it has to be John Mahama. So the natural question is, what must the NDC's uh, response be? You have seen it now. The NDC has uh, gone so much with, I'm with her, I'm with her, and, and on all of that. They're trying to change the narrative. When, mm. And when Evans put out those analyses, he talked about the baggage that John Mahama carries mm. into this election. You know, uh, the propaganda about John Evans at Tamils worked in 2000 and worked in 2004, in fact. In the last rally of the NPP in the central region, J.A. Kufo consistently repeated that thing. Would he be his own man? Of course, that worked. It didn't work in 2008. So for the NDC, you know, divert their attention to another person. Mm. And I think the NDP is reading into it and also trying to fight back to say it's him, right. not her. Well, this will, this will obviously uh, play out in a fascinating manner because... The truth is that the, the voter is not electing the running mate. They are electing the flag bearer. So there's going to be a need for the NDC to somehow uh, position the running mate as the future. So that even if you choose the flag bearer, you are getting the benefit of a running mate who symbolizes the future. Perhaps that might have to be NDC's uh, way through this. But the MPP certainly fighting back. Right now we can go back to UPSA's main auditorium where... Uh, the flag bearer of the NDC, Mr. John Dramani Mahama, is mounting the podium to address the uh, gathered dignitaries, about 100 or so of them, who are all here to see him unveil his running mate. Uh, Mr. John Dramani Mahama making his way up the stage. Everybody in the room is on their feet, holding their flags, ready to hail the former president. As he comes up, uh, an audiovisual display characterizing what they believe to be the strengths of their flag bearer. Uh, it's a profile of the flag bearer which is being shared. Let's go across and hear what is being said about John Dramani Mahama. Resilient. There are countless examples of situations where John Mahama stood his ground on unpopular but necessary policies for the sake of the future of the country. He is tough beyond measure and has stood the test of time and yet ready for more. Communicator. Mahama's eloquence and communication skills transcend the upper class of society. His message also sinks deep among the grassroots as well as the rural folk of our dear nation. Unifier. John Mahama is an all-round team player and a group builder. The makeup of his ministerial and public office appointments cuts across ethnic, cultural, social, ideological, and even political divides. Gender Equalizer. Mahama's first term saw one of the closest bridges in the gender equality gap. He is a strong believer in competence over gender and a supporter of women in high office and public positions. Religious. Mahama is a Christian by faith and a member of the Wingbury Assemblies of God Church and associated with the Men's Fellowship Wing. He is committed to God's Word and teaches it among his peers and fellowship members. Success driven. One of John Mahama's major traits is his determination to see a project through. He is meticulous by nature and pays extra attention to detail. Legacy. A chunk of Mahama's achievements are literally visible for all to see and can be identified in all major sectors. Housing. Health. Education. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing John Dramani Mahama. Right, 
you're live on Joy 99.7 FM. Uh, President John Romani Mahama about to address the gathering uh, at the unveiling of his running mate, Professor Nana Jane Okuku Ajiman. Uh, for our radio audiences, uh, you can't see the images, but we can certainly give you the reality of what's happening there. John Romani Mahama dressed in all white, standing at the podium, the two microphone podium, ready to address uh, the gathered uh, dignitaries uh, and tell them perhaps a little bit about why he made this choice, a little bit about why the ticket now uh, is what he believes can win in 2020. Uh, the stage is uh, quite nicely appointed uh, and um, we have uh, some great audio visuals to set the tone in the UPSA Auditorium. And of course, we are live on Joy 99.7 FM as well as Love 99.5 FM in Kumasi. Good evening to our audiences in the Ashanti region and beyond. We thank you so much for choosing us. This is your election headquarters, uh, the place to be for everything to do with the 2020 election. This, of course, a monumental point in the journey to 2020. We are about to hear the flag bearer of the NDC unveil his running mate. <laughs> Right now, Evans, this music uh, being played in the background, very, very significant, is it not? It is. I mean, in, in, our, in, in the recent history, um, I think it was first uh, John Kufo who began his campaign with gospel. And then I think it, um, Nana Dudaka Kufaru himself took it a, a notch higher. I don't know if you recall when he, he, he couched the campaign message out of the battle is the Lord's. Mm. And each time he mounted the stage, they will play this very uh, powerful gospel song. I forgot the name of the gospel song, but it's one of those very famous ones that they will play um, and it will charge the crowd. The crowd will be so excited, you know, like as if the angels were ascending and descending, you know, and clearly it's what John Mahama seemed to be doing as well. He's been standing at the podium waiting for a while, there's a song mm. play and soaking it in. Yes, it appears he is ready now to deliver his address. much that was a very <coughs> powerful and moving song and uh, it inspires me to do God's work and rescue this nation <laughs> members of the council of elders of our great party the national chairman general secretary and all members of the national Executive Committee, the Honorable Minority Leader, our former Speaker of Parliament, our great regional chairman, all assembled here, chairman, chairman of our National Campaign Committee, um, my friend and brother Joshua Labi, who is responsible for a lot of the wonderful work you see on this campus. Well done. <laughs> and most of all, my capable and elegant Professor Jane, Nana Jane Upokwa Jibang. All our party supporters across the length and breadth of our country watching this program and indeed, all our citizens and compatriots who are in your homes or wherever you are watching us, I say good evening and may God richly bless you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for making time to join us from all over our beautiful country and across the world. Today, the National Democratic Congress, the NDC, is taking the country Ghana on yet another positive and progressive journey. 
Two weeks ago, in compliance with the constitution of the NDC, I announced to the Council of Elders and the National Executive Committee my choice of Professor Nana Jane Opokwajiman as running mate for the December 2020 presidential elections. I wish to thank our founder, President Jerry John Rawlings, his deputy chair of the Council of Elders, Elijah Mahama Idrisu, and indeed all members of the Council of Elders, and also the National Executive Committee for the unanimous endorsement they gave to my choice. With Professor Nana Jenopokwa Jiman, I can say confidently that we have made the best choice for Ghana. I have, partnering with me by the grace of God, a vice presidential aspirant who complements and will ensure that we present to the people of Ghana a winning ticket and very experienced ticket, and indeed a most competent ticket. Today's momentous occasion is not only for our great party, the NDC, it is also for every single Ghanaian who cares about Ghana and is interested in seeing our nation reach the optimal level of progress, shared opportunities, and prosperity that we are capable of attaining. Professor Okokwa Jiman is the first female to be selected by one of the two major political parties that have won all elections in our country since the advent of the Fourth Republic in 1992. Indeed, the NDC remains the most successful political party in the history of Ghana. We have won four out of the seven presidential elections since the advent of the Fourth Republic. With the support of the Ghanaian people and by the grace of God, we will win our fifth election in December 2020. <laughs> to bring development to all our citizens in every corner of Ghana and to advance social justice. The choice of Professor Pukwa Jiman is over and above affirmative action because she is more than qualified to serve as vice president of this country. She's a woman who has contributed to shattering the many glass ceilings that have held women down for generations by becoming the first female to lead and manage a public university in Ghana. As I described her, in my statement following the announcement I made, she is God-fearing, a distinguished scholar, a conscientious public servant, and a role model. The NDC has a lot to show when it comes to putting women at the forefront of leadership. Women constitute about 50% of Ghana's population, and women form the majority of Ghana's workforce. They must lead in order to advance our nation's progress. And we've been vindicated at every turn by the sterling output of these female high flyers. It was the NDC that presented Ghana's first female Speaker of Parliament, the first female Foreign Minister, the first female Attorney General, the first female chairperson of the Electoral Commission, the first female chairperson of the National Commission for Civic Education, and the first female chairperson of the Council of State, and indeed many others. There are a host of other key positions where our women have distinguished themselves and elevated the name and image of Ghana by their first-rate performance. Unlike the MPP, we in the NDC recognize and appreciate the knowledge, industry, passion, creativity, and problem-solving skills of our women. 
With Professor Opoku Ajiman, the NDC has once again stayed our true course and advanced a step further in our established philosophy of inclusivity by boldly presenting one of our best in intellect and character as our party's running mate. Together with Nana Jane, we will work with you, each and every Ghanaian, to place our country back on the track of progress and opportunities for all and shared prosperity. This, we will build on the foundation of social justice, self-belief, unity, integrity, transparency, and accountability. Working together with Nana Jane, a brilliant and accomplished woman, I have no doubt that God's grace will shine on us in the elections of December 2020. I'm convinced that with her zeal for service and her unquestionable integrity, she will greatly impact the developmental focus of our activities as a party and when we come into government. She has already begun her policy briefings sessions as incoming vice president, ready and willing to work hard for Ghanaians. <laughs> Nana's impeccable record is endless, and her reach across various sectors is overwhelmingly impressive. For example, I was glad when one of her sterling contributions to academia and healthcare as my Minister for Education was announced to have sequenced the genome of the virus which causes coronavirus disease. And I'm referring to the establishment of the West African Center for Cell Biology of Infectious Pathogens. Many people do not know that she led the creation of that institution. <laughs> Leading the transformation of our educational sector as our Minister for Education, my running mate supervised the achievement of many feats that make me proud to be working with her. She converted polytechnics into fully fledged technical universities. And she supervised the upgrading of the colleges of education into tertiary institutions and led the negotiations that secured the World Bank funding for the flagship secondary education improvement program, SAFE, that says that saw the major upgrading of facilities in senior high schools and the construction of 23 community day senior high schools. For most of you who remember that facility, it had to do, you remember in parliament it was called the, was it Tampax uh, facility or uh, Pampas, Pampas facility? because it involved giving women what they needed for their monthly, giving the student girls what they needed for their monthly um, something. And uh, <laughs> our colleagues on the other side didn't understand it, but it was a very good intervention. Furthermore, facilities in 50 less endowed senior high schools and 75 underperforming senior high schools were upgraded under this facility working with the educational unions and other educational authorities, teacher absenteeism was reduced during her tenure from 27% to 7%. <laughs> Nana also improved the quality of basic education, which resulted in Ghana's all-time best BEC performance. She introduced the private BECE and recruited 2,400 mathematics and science teachers as a special intervention to improve teaching and learning of mathematics and science at the senior secondary school level. She also achieved Ghana's overall best performing West African Secondary School Certificate Examination National Award by WAEC for four consecutive years when she was Minister of Education. During the period 
of her tenure at the Ministry of Education, she engaged more than 40,000 newly recruited teachers. 40,000 newly recruited teachers. During the four years she served as Minister of Education, you can check the Ministry of Education website, and it is there. As you will all recall, we abolished the quota system at the Colleges of Education, leading to an increase in enrollment from just 9,000 students to 15,400 st students and created more teaching opportunities for our youth. It was under Professor Pukwa Jimang that teachers were automatically posted without national service and licensure examinations. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, having worked closely with Nana, what I salute about her and the world acknowledges and equally celebrates as true is the fact that she's an achiever of unquestionable integrity. She's a resourceful and results-driven resource leader. It is regrettable that following my announcement of her as my running mate, several key leaders of the MPP administration and party launched a barrage of misogynistic attacks at her, just on the basis of her gender. These attacks are unacceptable and most unfortunate. And this is not what the severely distressed people of Ghana deserve at this time. We surely can do better. Our politics has evolved into one of insults, intimidation, and unfortunately, in many cases, has become increasingly violent. This is anathema to the sustainability of the health and wealth of our republic, bought for, fought for, and won through the blood and toil of our forefathers. As seven leaders, we pledge to abide by the ethics of a clean campaign, devoid of insults, we shall present our message to the people of Ghana in a clear and succinct manner. We also pledge that our promises will be a sacred social contract that will be honored and not betrayed. This pledge is to all, including our compatriots who have lost interest, faith, and hope in our politics. We will change the face of our politics so that no one will be considered less Ghanaian or more Ghanaian than the other. <laughs> On the basis of our ownership of a political party card, Let's face it, there are many Ghanaians who do not belong to the NPP, the NDC, or any known political party. They detest the persistent acrimony associated with our politics. They do not possess a party card, and yet day in and day out, they contribute significantly to building our country. Today, we're witnessing a course of action never seen in our country. And so my message to them is there is hope for us. Indeed, the selection of Professor Opokwa Jiman as our running mate is a demonstration of the many bold and progressive changes the next NDC administration that I will lead, inshallah, will embark upon. The involvement of women in the decision-making process will not end at the level of the Vice Presidency. We will work again towards the attainment of a minimum of 30% of all appointments going to women. We have an opportunity in this election as Ghanaians to fully give meaning to gender equality 
and also to have a highly educated and disciplined woman placed in a critical position to influence policy and shape our nation's destiny. We will implement a set of robust health policies and plans aimed at aggressively tackling and reducing maternal mortality by half from the current 319 per 100,000 life deaths. We shall ensure female social, social economic improvement. We shall enact the spousal rights law, establish exclusive and secured shelters for abused women and children, and provide opportunities for all. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as a Social Democratic Party, we seek to harness the best qualities in all our people to transform the destiny of our nation. And in that direction, and as the fulcrum around which our health policy will evolve, we will, before the end of 2021, introduce and begin the implementation of a free primary health care plan. This will make the provision of primary health care to all Ghanaians, young and elderly, free. Our free health care plan will guarantee a healthy people and provide a healthy workforce needed to accelerate our development. My brothers and sisters, the 2020 elections will be a referendum on the four years of the Nana Akufuado presidency. Four years of nepotism, four years of corruption, four years of stagnation, four years of deliberately abandoning of badly needed social and economic infrastructure, four years of dehumanization, four years of disenfranchising Ghanaians, four years of stripping Ghanaians of their citizenship, four years of deliberate collapse of indigenous Ghanaian businesses, four years of massive job losses, four years of economic hardship. This will be a referendum on the term of a president who has no real solutions for Ghana. A president who is hell-bent on doing whatever it takes to stay in power, including against sound advice, replacing the very voters' register which brought him into office. <clears throat> My heart goes out to the many who have been affected by this government's unjustifiable collapse of Ghanaian-owned financial institutions. It is heart-wrenching to hear government officials justify the huge amount it is spending to manage the impact of the collapse of Ghanaian financial institutions, which they now put at a whopping 21 billion Ghana cities. I weep for the many who have lost their jobs, the many who have lost their jobs, the many who have lost their businesses, and the many who have lost their livelihoods as a result of these policies. I pledge on behalf of the NDC that we shall, within one year, of being in office, pay all funds that have been locked up with the collapsed financial institutions. <laughs> Within our first year in office, we shall pay to all the beneficiaries all funds locked up in the collapsed financial institutions. It is a promise. We shall not put together any long-term payment plan that will further worsen the li living conditions of the victims. As has been introduced in other economies, the next NDC administration will establish 
a financial services authority that will be responsible for ensuring that consumer financial markets work for consumers and providers and for the economy as a whole. This financial services authority will oversee all financial products and services that are offered to consumers and will effectively and efficiently prevent and stop the challenges that have confronted uh, customers of Men's Gold, DKM and others. We will restore Ghanaian indigenous investment in the banking and financial sector. And we will do this through a tiered banking structure in order to restore viable credit sources for Ghanaian SMEs. And we will make amends for those whose businesses were collapsed due to political victimization. We will send all contractors with valid contracts who have been sitting at home for four years without being paid for legitimate work done for government back to site. And we will make immediate arrangements to pay them their hard-earned monies deliberately withheld by the Nanado administration due to politics. Ladies and gentlemen, weak infrastructure does not propel growth and improvement in the quality of the lives of people. And this is precisely why my presidency took aggressive steps to develop and consolidate our healthcare infrastructure, our educational infrastructure, our transport infrastructure, and our digital infrastructure. This is how to build a resilient nation. Without creating and consolidating a developed infrastructure, no nation, no nation, and I say, can resist the global shocks that come from time to time. Just imagine for a second how Ghana would have been without the investment of Ghana Medical Center. Without the Ghana East District Hospital, as the number of COVID-19 cases keep rising in our country. The speed of building and consolidating our infrastructure has slowed down because the current government is largely ignoring the infrastructural buffers that are needed to build resilience in the face of external shocks. The NDC believes in Ghana's future and will address the issues that affect you, each and every one of us. We'll build a peaceful, secure, and strong economy that provides sustainable jobs through a transformed, industrialized, and digital economy. We'll reinforce the independence of state institutions, such as the Electoral Commission, such as the Auditor General's Department, such as IOKO, and the Commission for Human Rights and Administrative Justice. Single source procurement, popularly called sole sourcing, will be the exception rather than the rule. In pursuance of social justice, I'll vigorously push through a constitutional review that creates a fairer and just emolument system and removes the distortions between Article 71 office holders and other public sector employees. We will, as part of an Integrity for Development Action Plan, launch what I call Operation Sting. Operation Sting will be an anti-corruption crusade which under my watch will involve massive, far-reaching and practical government reform. It will be a ruthless system that fights against all corrupt political appointees and public sector workers. It will be a requirement for all who serve in my government to publish their assets declarations and have the same audited by the Auditor General. Of course, the elephantine size of government consisting of 125 ministers or more 
we have been burdened with over these last four years will be reduced drastic drastically. And the savings that we will make from the emoluments of these reduced number of ministers and the privileges that they enjoy will be channeled towards rewarding assembly members to perform the function will be channeled towards paying assembly members to perform the function of collecting accurate birth and death information in their various electoral areas. And I'm sure this will give better meaning that will satisfy our Supreme Court about the value of our birth certificates. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, tonight, is for my running mate and my vice presidential candidate. I'll save the rest for my policy dialogue sessions, which I'll be starting soon, and the launch of our manifesto in August next month, during which we'll discuss and debate the NDC solutions and plans for our country. Our plans will include an aggressive job and entrepreneurial program in the public and private sectors that will deliver a minimum of 250,000 jobs every year. And a total of more than a million jobs across the country by the end of my term in office in 2024. We will put Ghanaians back to work to earn a decent living. Congratulations, Professor Nana Jinopokwa Jiman, the first female vice chancellor of a public university in Ghana, on your selection and acceptance to be our party's running mate. Together, we have made the best choice for Ghana. Together, we'll work for the women of Ghana We'll work for the youth of Ghana. We'll work for the people of Ghana. I assure you, you have my fullest and unalloyed support. You have the fullest support of the NDC and the support of millions of Ghanaians, including young people who you have either directly trained in your long career as an educationist of repute, or those who ha you have inspired by your stellar achievements. We cannot fail them. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present to the good people of Ghana, Professor Nana Jinopokwa Jiman, by the grace of God and the will of the Ghanaian people, the next Vice President of the Republic of Ghana. Thank you, and God richly bless you. Thank you. Romani Mahama steps up to the podium, prepares to deliver her maiden policy statement, and of course the choir in attendance filling the auditorium with music to which the running mates and the flag bearer dance on the spot just behind the podium. Music always playing an important role in events like this. We're live of course on Joy 99.7 FM, 
which explains to those of you watching on television why we are making the effort to give some commentary of what is going on. We're also live on Love 99.5 FM. We're on Asempa FM, on ATL FM in Cape Coast, and many other affiliates who are carrying our programming live to the rest of the nation. This is the ticket. As Professor Nana Jane Ukuku Ajiman prepares to present her maiden address to the gathered dignitaries of the NDC, uh, the mood in the room is that of jubilation as they await her very first, her first policy Sorry. statement. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege and ple pleasure to present to you our vice presidential candidate, Professor Nana Jane Opoku Ajiman. With her first up. Thank you very much, all of you. Nananum, my boss, His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, leader of the NDC, and soon to be reinstated as President of the Republic. Thank you for your kind words. I give thanks to God for all the positive things you said. Thank you, Chairman of Fusu Apofo, and Comrade Desi Edwin Katia, the one and only General Mosquito. Thank you also. I also recognize the Vice Chair of the Council of Elders, the Leader of the Minority in Parliament, former Speaker of Parliament, colleagues, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, please consider yourself individually addressed. My brothers and sisters, the past three weeks have been interesting and sobering for me. Indeed, it has been a humbling experience. Ebenezer, this is how far you have brought your handmaids. This is how far you have brought Ghana. We thank you for all that is past, and we trust you for all that is to come. I wish to express sincere gratitude to the founder, His Excellency J.J. Rawlings, the Council of Elders, members of the National Executive Committee, the Functional Executive Committee, the entire rank and file of the NDC, and general public for their incredible support and for their many, many words of encouragement, those pronounced publicly and those spoken in private. I'm grateful to all of you. We are all aware that much as many have come before me, you've heard a lot of their names, many have come before me. This is the first time in our history that a major political party has nominated a woman on his ticket to become vice president. I wish to assure the leadership and rank and file of the party that I come to this position with the mindset of a team player. I belong to all of you and will always count on your support and guidance. This is a journey we will take together. Your Excellency John 
Ramani Mahama, your singular decision to select me as your running mate has generated a whole web of responsibilities, a whole web of responses rather, and debates in this country. And I keep saying that I didn't know that my name will create such an atmosphere. But importantly, out of all the debates, the major po point for me is the new focal point for girls and women. You have respected women. The women of Ghana will not forget. The youth will remember. Generations to come will commit your decision to memory and make it a reference point. We will partner with our men and youth as we always have done and work hard to achieve peace in our land because that is the best way to respond to this high recognition. Thank you very much. <laughs> Making history is gratifying, but, but what really matters is not to be the first through the door. What matters is to hold that door open for those behind us. What matters is to create other avenues for self-actualization for many more. That is the work of the next four years. Many are those who are now more energized to vote thanks to the momentous decision, JM, that you have made. I urge them all to do just that. We plan not to disappoint you. By your advice and your choice, you have turned the struggles of many women who have come before this moment into a probability. We, and I refer to the men, the women, our youth, our children, we all have a chance to finally make real our dreams of serving this country at any level, of removing doubts and proving once again that collectively we are all capable. This is the time we have been waiting for. Alo nyemi mi male. Ensa yebo tu mi aye. Nyame nye hembo afo. Yeah. I know sometimes it gets emotional, for which we will not apologize, because emotions only confirm our humanity. <laughs> After serious reflection, consultations, prayers, and encouragement of colleagues, of family, of my, my children, I am very happy to have accepted the nomination to be the running mate of the presidential candidate of the great National Democratic Congress. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this is an act of faith which I do not take lightly at all. I do not underrate the huge responsibilities and expectations that come with the call. I heard some of the women. But I call all, on all of us to translate our excitement and approval into action for the benefit of the good people of our beloved country. I accepted the nomination fundamentally because it is an opportunity to serve my country once again, albeit at a higher level. In God do I continue to trust that I may never be confounded. And I know the Methodists among us know where that line is coming from. I am deeply humbled by the trust of our party and nation, and I'm excited to make a good case to the good people of Ghana as to why the J&J &J ticket is best poised to confront the daunting challenges of our time and usher Ghana into peace, into recovery, into prosperity. It will be my mission to ensure 
that the voices and concerns of our children, our youth, our aged, and our persons with disabilities are reflected in critical decisions. Together, all of us, we can strategize to solve long-standing problems of needless and unproductive discrimination and thrive as valued citizens. I want you all, all of us, in whatever demographic category to know that I will carry your voices forward. Together we can make this happen. This I pledge to you. I wish that going forward, I could meet you again in the same fashion we did when we started the process of framing our manifesto and listen to your concerns, challenges, and hopes for the future. It would have been my job and my joy, as I've done in the past, to sit with you in the market, in your shop, on the farms, at the beaches, by the roadside, and in the institutions, to think and plan together, argue and even laugh at each other. But these are not normal times. COVID-19 is real, no doubt. There is no doubt about it that it is real. However, we will together find safer ways to meet and talk and plan and strategize for the good of our country. We will collectively work out the way forward so that we own our agenda. We must own our agenda in this country. Men and women together have accomplished fantastic things in our history. But I'm also acknowledged that today I stand on the shoulders of many giants who came before me. Throughout our history, women have always played pivotal roles in the advancement of what today has become our country. When duty called, our women too responded. We all have in mind great heroines who by their actions shattered the concept that women alone must be restricted by ceilings and limitations. I salute those many women who have made such great contributions to the advancement of our country. And just as importantly, I pay homage to those many, many unknown women the silent and invisible and unacknowledged women and men who also played and continue to play critical roles in building what we now call Ghana. Now do allow me to tell you a little bit about myself, very briefly. I'm Nana Jane. I think that's news. <laughs> yeah. I was born in Cape Coast a town with rich and intriguing connections to the Ghanaian story. My parents come from the holy city of Komenda. Remember the Komenda Sugar Factory? They are called Kofinyame in Abata. I won't tell you their Christian names. And these two people are, have blessed the earth and are blessed of God and man forever. I wish them peaceful rest. One of my beloved mothers, biological mother of my oldest sibling, who became a great friend, comes from Alabanyo, but she spent a great deal of her life in Pando. Mama Ruth, Hedemye, Growing up as a little girl, I didn't dream of standing in this position, not that I knew that it even existed. However, what I knew and what I believed, along with my siblings, was that if I studied and focused enough, and especially if my actions benefited others before they benefited me, there was nothing impossible to achieve in our beloved country. 
I still believe these values that other people matter too. My parents believed and they demonstrated in our lives that good quality education and hard work would open for me a world of possibilities. My parents' conviction made us all believe in our own ability to pursue any goal and also believe in the rewards of grit and determination. Becoming the first female vice chancellor in Ghana was for me the most tangible testament to this fact. And here, let me once again congratulate Professor Rita Dixon, recently appointed vice chancellor of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. And as well, to extend congratulations to Dr. Koyo Enim Wright, who becomes the first female registrar of UPSA where this event is taking place. This country called Ghana has given me the opportunity to live out that promise and to aspire to the limits of my own potential. It has continuously rewarded a life of hard work and offered me the privilege to give back through service. It is precisely because of where my story began that I know what is possible in this country and what the individual can achieve. These are the same lessons I passed on to my students and of course to my children and nephews and so on. And especially I hope to pass on to my two adorable grandsons the joys of my life. But it is also because of where my story began that I know it takes more than just great and good work ethic. I had good opportunities also. That made a difference in my life because my origins and upbringing are not unique. Villages and towns across our country are full of stories like mine. They are full of parents, making untold sacrifices for the sake of their children and to ensure their futures. They are full of market women, fishermen, and farmers toiling in the sun to feed their children on their backs and those they have left behind at home. The stories are full of young mothers and fathers who are balancing family life work obligations and entrepreneurial ambitions. The young mother and yes, the young father who often has to manage family life, employment and other commitments seamlessly. We are a people who jump over many hurdles. This too shall pass. Walking that road is an act of courage. That experience is a forge of character. Villages and towns in our country are full of brilliant young people with great ambitions and boundless energy. They are full of young people who rightly aspire to bring their own children into a better Ghana than their parents did. We must facilitate that. Throughout the years, I have been blessed to meet and interact with numerous Ghanaians in every region of our country whose experiences echo mine. I have taught and mentored thousands of youth from all walks of life over the course of my career. And I have always been inspired by their passion, by their determination, by their posit positivity, and by their desire to succeed. But without good, meaningful opportunities, all of that toil and resilience and determination sum up to nothing. But frustration and all that youthful energy amounts to yet more wasted potential. We must harvest that. Far too often in this country, 
This is how the story ends. And so, clearing the hurdles in their path, giving them a hand up and not just a hand out, offering them plans and not just promises, these must be the immediate priorities of our national agenda. In today's turbulent political economic climate, I propose that there are four crucial factors to consider in tackling issues relating to youth and gender. First, we must be mindful of the fact that 60% of our population will be under the age 30 in a few years ahead of us. This is why it is so important and critical that we systematically reform all our institutions and all our systems to effectively address the aspirations of our youth in this country. Second, second we need meaningful quality and comprehensive education that goes beyond access and numbers and responds to the future we can actualize. Third, we must leverage on vocational and technical training to equip many into fulfilling and creative and meaningful work. Such will advance our development. Fourth, Fourth, we must provide opportunities that transcend political patronage, connection, the practice of whom you know. We need equal opportunity and fair opportunities based on merit. And these are imperative for sustainable economic growth. The time for that shift is now. Truth be told, despite all our challenges, Ghana remains a special place where any dream should be possible, where every aspiration matters, where everyone, be it a little boy from Boli or a little girl from Komenda, can and should aspire to be anything they want to be, even president even vice president. And this is why we love our country so much. We must continue to make this country a place we cherish and are proud to belong to, a place of opportunities. In the past and more so recently, I have had extensive discussions with His Excellency John Mahama about issues confronting our country and his vision for the coming years. These have been broad, passionate, and engaging. In John Mahama, and you have to work closely to get to know other aspects of him, you'll find a person who is thoughtful, visionary, makes no claim to perfection, and admits his mistakes and missteps, and valuable lessons learned from them. Surely, our society is better served with such down-to-earth, considerate, and reflective leadership. We have chosen the path of peace, inclusiveness, self-reliance, leading to belief in ourselves to solve our problems. It is an important avenue through which to turn our current circumstances into opportunities that yield great dividends for us all. And us in this context should and must include generations unborn. It is our business to think about them also. Their lives also matter. It is clear that with the right direction and resolve, with all of us being part of the forward march, our country is destined for greatness. We can and must write the course of our country. We all admit that we can put our country on a firmer, more sustainable path, a path of peace, in order to move forth in ways that are meaningful and clear. At this time, 
I say to the SHS students who are writing the exams, let me assure you that I have children your age in the same situation too, if not biological. Therefore, I understand the difficult situation you are going through, and especially the anxiety that you have as some of your colleagues and staff got infected by the COVID-19. There are also, sadly, reports of deaths of students and other staff. The partisan nature of our politics today makes it difficult for even to ask a simple question about the handling of the COVID-19 pandemic without triggering a whole political brawl. This is not helpful. All the same, my condolences to the family. Believe us, many of us share in your loss. I ask us all to be very disciplined about following the WHO guidelines and government directives by taking good care of ourselves. And some of us may understand these protocols a little better. Let us share that knowledge. Let us save lives, no matter whose life is saved. Countrymen and women, all we are doing right now is what has been and has always been a very simple exercise of registration. What is not so simple this time is that the exercise is taking place in a time of a dreadful pandemic that is still evolving and in our case still rising. As if all of this is not bad enough, the level of violence, brute force, bloodletting, and sheer breakdown of law and order in an otherwise straightforward act of registering to vote is unbecoming of our country, especially of a country, especially of a country that until recently was hailed as the fulcrum of democracy in our region. How did we descend into this situation? The answer is simple. When there appears to be selective justice, when some offenders are not even placed on the hook, but are hailed and promoted and excused for being nasty and violent, the logical outcome is what we see. This situation of people dying, being harassed because they have decided to register to vote. It's not a story you can tell any child in the future. How will you begin that story? And when that child asks you their favorite question, why, what will we say? And if they add a few questions and they ask, so what did you do? Or what did you say? What will be our response? We need to show up and vote come December 7th. Each one of us must jealously guard our sacred right to vote and reject the attempts by some to disenfranchise some. We are all Ghanaians and we love this country deeply and we make contributions to the running of our country. Do not let anyone make you feel otherwise. The choice we have in this election is very clear. We can either build a Ghana where every citizen, regardless of background, is afforded equal opportunity to become their best selves, or we can continue on a path where a few people attempt to control and dictate the destiny of the people who have given them the privilege to govern in the first place. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let our policies deviate from this unproductive path of injustice and non-peace. We, the people of Ghana, all of us, are the protectors and owners of this country for our collective good and for that of generations unborn. You know, what makes Ghana so special is that despite our various ethnic groups, religions, diverse backgrounds, we all come together as one people under one flag, inspired by the sacrifices of our ancestors to create a great country. 
and everyone's ancestor has been a worthy contributor to the space we now call Ghana. This country now called Ghana, whose artificial borders sadly we seek to make even more artificial, as if our continent has not suffered enough from the initial assault. Everyone matters. We have come too far as a nation to still cling to our primordial tribal big countries. This must stop. Diversity is a source of great strength. Whether you are Ga, Infante, Sisali, Ewe, whether you are Gonja, Asante, Zema, or whatever, or Mampusi, or any other ethnic group, you are valued as a Ghanaian. You have every right to walk with confidence, with a high resolve to make huge contributions to this country. Let nobody, let no one, question your identity or your patriotism. It is time to put all these needless, unproductive, and downright backward distractions behind us and get on with the serious business of nation building. The time is now. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the 21st century is nearly 20% over. We shouldn't be here as a country living with inexcusable insanitary conditions, with our babies still dying of malaria, our women delivering on the bare floor, our youth bewildered and unable to see their way ahead, parents confused about the future of their children and the quality of education they are getting. If we choose to be anywhere as a country, the destination should not include a place where a 90-year-old woman is stoned to death because somebody has decided that she's a witch. What is that? I call on our security agencies to convince us that she has not died in vain. As indicated, the 21st century is nearly 20% of the time gone, and we shouldn't be here. The very foundations of our democracy so threatened by unimaginable levels of arrogance, of intolerance, of violence, of human beings playing God, our economy struggling, our tongues tied to the roof of our mouths, our citizens feeling unsafe, our farmers unsure of when to plant crops due to climate change. We shouldn't be here in the 21st century our youth perishing on their way to find better lives away from home. Our institutions to which we should run for succor rapidly losing credibility. We shouldn't be here when children who should be in school are becoming unwitting brides. When we all know that marriage is not a child's business. At a time of a growing number of cases and deaths arising from the pandemic, with their attendant fears and uncertainties, uncertainties, at a time when some of our children are leaving school not any more literate than when they entered, others graduating into unemployment, the vulnerable and cared for, none of us should be here behaving as if the best response or the best antidote to all of the above is to flex muscles, to turn aspects of our protective institutions into agents of intimidation, and arrogate to ourselves the right to alienate people who have always lived on this part of the world, long before some did, and who have served our country with distinction. Other things should be occupying our time in the 21st century. We can spend all those resources and energies on ways to confront our artificial borders and work towards the inclusion that solidifies our continent. Let me assure our youth that we have not always been like this. I have had endless conversations with many of you, and I can understand your frustrations and sense of despair. But as I keep 
assuring you, we have not always been like this. No, as you also know, we have not always been like this. Giving up is never an option. Stay the course. As a people, we have survived many unspeakable atrocities. Read and know your history. We just celebrated the year of return. And I'm addressing the youth now. We've, we've just celebrated that. Read that history very, very carefully. And you'll notice that our history has not been a very nice cup of chilled sobolo. Yes, we are in a difficult phase. And this phase will only pass with our collective determination, plain, honest, hard work, and willingness to put in practice those values of integrity, of meritocracy, and of inclusiveness. Let's reignite the Ghanaian spirit of caring, of sharing, of kind hospitality, and sincerity. We know we can. All minds linked, God our helper. I wish to assure our Muslim brothers and sisters that as our leader John Dramani Mahama has consistently done in the past, going forward, there will be none of the unwarranted discrimination directed at you, and indeed, no Ghanaian should feel alienated due to religion or ethnicity. This coming Thursday is a great day of Arafah, and the Prophet Muhammad, may he rest in peace, admonished you to fast. In this moment, please pray for us. Especially pray for the peace of this country and pray for Allah's bountiful blessings. I wish you all Eid Mubarak in advance. <laughs> to all the little girls and boys across our country, always dream big. Remain focused. You can grow to become anything you want to be. Believe that only you can stop yourself. Going forward, it is not going to be about your parents, rich or poor, not the region you come from, whether it is endowed with resources or not. It is going to be about a system that works, a functioning country that respects all its citizens and provides opportunity to everybody, no matter what. The time is ripe for change. That time is now. <laughs> to my sisters and daughters, we are in this together. You know, as I do, that it has not been and it will not be an easy walk. But as we all know, it's a possible walk. We will walk it and we will get there. I know too well the unspoken and unspeakable weight of responsibilities and concerns that we bear as women, much more so at these difficult times. What we have always shown, however, is that when we have the opportunity, many of us choose to bring on our best game. We earn our seat at the table and we excel. Our results, our benefits, transform our families, communities, and country. And sometimes our benefits go beyond our borders, porous, artificial, or otherwise. Our democracy has come a long way, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, yet it remains fragile. It calls on all of us to exercise our civic duty against any obstacles and machinations. I urge us all to show up and participate in the last phases of the registration exercise, even whilst you observe all the health protocols. Please look out for each other. Politely remind people to wear their face masks correctly. Offer your hand sanitizer to somebody in need. If you see a disabled person or an elderly person or a pregnant woman, offer help for that is the Ghanaian spirit. I 
extend a hand to everybody, no matter how disappointed you have become, no matter the depth of your frustration, your anger, no matter the depth of your despair, come. Let us chart a path for our country built on the values of trust, of responsible citizenship, of putting others first, and of speaking polite language. Come, let us link our efforts and thoughts to rebuild our institutions. Let's build a truly independent, inclusive nation that is not afraid to respect the views of others, a country confident enough to accept other ways of seeing, of respecting everyone, no matter the person. I'm calling on our men, women, our youth, our children, that we should team up and build the Ghana we can have, which must belong to all of us, and which must pay special working and workable attention to the vulnerable. We must bring back the proverbial Ghanaian hospitality. That seems locked down, if not quarantined. We must ease restrictions on the Ghana we know that respects, that tolerates, that liberates. The time is now. As a country, Ghana has been poised for flight for too long. Ghana must be in full flight. We should be in full flight towards a sustainable, towards sustainable development to a destination of peace, inclusion, self-confidence, plain honesty, where good old hard work matters. I call on all our countrymen and women who believe that our country can once again travel the path of hope to come join us. The time to do that is now. Forth in the name of our country we go. We will not be intimidated. Our resolve to serve this country remains strong. And as my nephew says, no shaking. And sometimes he adds, no bagawaya. We will stay the course. Sorry. We will not be distracted. We shall remain focused. We will raise high the flag of Ghana. The time to do so is now. And inshallah, we will succeed. May God bless you all. May God bless you, JM, for this decision that has generated so much. May God bless our determination to serve our country May God bless the NDC. May God bless our homeland, Ghana. I thank you for your kind attention. Good night. Please, Ghana flags, Ghana flags, Ghana flags, Ghana flags. Let me see you wave your Ghana flags, your Ghana flags. You're still live here on your election headquarters. You're live on Joy 99.7 FM. You're live on the Joy News Channel, live on Lab FM, live on La Sempa. We are on Facebook, obviously. We are also uh, streaming live on myjoyonline.com. Uh, this is PM Express, of course, um, as we continue our special coverage of the outdooring of <laughs> Professor <laughs> Nana Jane Opukwajima, the running mate to uh john dramani mahama we've listened to her now she's made her mating speech and we've also heard uh from the man himself the uh the man whose face is going to be on the ballot come december 7 
John Dramani Mahama live from the UPSA. My colleagues are still with me here on your election headquarters. Of course, this time is uh, PM Express, and so of course I have uh, managed to uh, remove Kojo Yangtze. It takes a lot to do that, <laughs> uh, but I've successfully managed that. And as you can see, uh, seated uh, with MFA Pau joining us and uh, the re regular suspects also. <laughs> um, Winston Amwa is with us also. Let me start with MFA Pau because this is the first time we're going to hear her voice. She's been in the background listening to this quite attentively. Now, MFA, what, what do you make of, this is the first time we're hearing her speak in detail. I wonder what your reactions are. Well, she's both as an academic. It came out, um, we could all tell that a rather long and winding beginning. Um, I was with her a lot there at some point. And she came on different, uh, because <laughs> this is the first time we've actually heard her a uh, long speech like that. But at some point, it felt like she was speaking to her students. But a number of things um, stand out, though, uh, because uh, she talks about herself at some point, where the fanti in her actually comes out, and Kojo would agree, uh, where she brings in uh, the wittiness and all that. But she talks about, I was expecting uh, to hear about the policy, because we, we, we heard that she's led uh, you know, the policy engagement uh, with the party uh, faithful. But I was hoping that I would get that outlining of the policies that, of course, that the NDC is hoping to put. I heard that in John Mahama's speech, mm -hmm. where he outlines the things that, more like the manifesto, what they are hoping, the promises, and what they are hoping to do when they come to power. But I didn't hear that from Nana Jane. Of course, she's just a running mate. But she puts out some four factors that she calls, I, I think is the closest will be the policy uh, statement that I would have heard from her tonight. So she talks about addressing aspirations of the youth. Mm -hmm. uh, she talks about that. She also talks about a meaningful quality education beyond access and, of course, just the numbers. Mm. That's a job for the free SHS. You yeah. know, they've always uh, talked about it, not just quality, not just access. Mm. He talks about that also. And then also turning uh, technical education. You know, John Mohammed mentioned that she led uh, the polytechnics being turned into technical education or technical universities, the tertiary level. He talks about that also. And then the fourth, provide opportunities that transcend political connections. Uh, merit and not just the whom you know uh, she talks about. But at some point, like I said, uh, she lost me, but I've had to follow just because of the analysis of this. Um, it, it was long, it was winding, but of course, um, inspiring at some point also. She now talks about the COVID fight and asking us all to adhere to it. This is something we've heard over and over again, mm. uh, of course. So I, I wasn't expecting that from her. But of course, uh, those who are watching and listening uh, would hear that advice as well. And then also touches on the more important thing also happening now, which is uh, the violence that has characterized uh, the registration exercise, where she talks about it. And then the time is ripe for change. Um, OK, so that's how uh, she wraps up. And um, I think that largely, yeah, it's something we're expecting from her, but I was expecting more. Mm. But this is inspiring. Yeah. But for me, I've heard you uh, make all the analysis or talk about a couple of things as to what she brings on the ticket. Of course, this is the ticket, the hashtag, the ticket. I'll be sending you onto social media shortly on mm. what people have been saying on the analysis that you've put out. But for me, I'm hoping that this choice of picking a woman uh, to partner John Mahama will not just be a facade because we would end up making her just a ceremonial, you know, vice president, should they win. That is what I'm hoping mm. that the NDC will guard against. Mm. And then also, there's this issue of the factionalism in the NDC. Is she able to bridge that gap? Because it, it appears that we are making Professor Jane Nano Pukwajiman as one that holds the magic wand mm. to turn around every fortune of the NDC. Well, they've talked about the educational development that they are hoping that she will bring on board. They've also talked about the integrity. Mm -hmm. You heard John Mahama also talk about mm -hmm. it, that she has impeccable character. I heard you in your analysis also talk about the fact that she's incorruptible. Well, we are yet to see any scandal mm -hmm. uh, that uh, she's involved in of a sort. But we've heard also uh, the issues that were raised by uh, the Opoku, uh, Opoku Prempe, the current um, education minister on her fortunes when she was in that sector. Whether she's able to turn around the education fortunes of the NDC, because that will, you know, because we know that the flagship of the NPP now is the free SHS. That is something, it's the trump card mm. that they are keeping so close to their chest. But the issues about she not being vexed in the economic issues and all, 
we've had the examples of, um, you know, uh, uh, Professor Mills, the late Professor Mills, when he was brought on. Of course, he had knowledge in the area of economics. But was he a cut-out politician? And that's the issue that comes up with Jane. You've, I will not belabor mm. the point because you've, you've made all those points. Uh, one thing that um, I was talking to you earlier back, back in, the, in the back room was the issue about her oratory skills. Mm. Whether she can move the people, hmm. the I mean, grassroots. That, that is an important point. Yeah. I mean, I Whether if, she mounts, if she mounts the campaign platform, we don't know what will happen if we can have rallies. We hmm. are yet to know that we are easing restrictions. We are in the second phase. But before December elections, we would know if we can now have the huge political rallies or there will be different ways of doing this. But if she mounts the campaign platform, we've seen her speak today, very inspiring because it's a different crowd today and all. But the day comes that she has to mount the campaign platform. Will it be the same Mami Zubako? But I've heard <laughs> Winston say that you don't need to have the Choboy kind of voice. You will definitely have a John the Baptist that can clear the way in the, in the form of Elvis Ifrianka, for instance, who will do the Choboy and the Mahama, Mahama, Mahama. So we'll get to that point and then we'll know. But let me just leave it here for now. But I'm just hoping that we are not picking a woman just because we want to get... Uh, the women to rally well, behind them. I don't know. This is substantive. And so yeah, what we I, I don't know if I will vote for the NDC just because they have a woman. But yeah. it is significant that they have a woman as and a running it. mate. That I will applaud. Yeah, of course. That's, that's yes, what I because call it's the, the first for the two main political parties. So that's a call that I would applaud. But we don't end up just wanting to have women votes. And yeah. then you bring her into power, or if she just they for win, that purpose. then just for that purpose, then you just make her an armchair vice president, a ceremonial vice president, who just, you know, receives uh, delegations. And really, <laughs> will she have a say? She should be able to have a say as a woman. Mm. And then we will know. If they win. If they win. Let me bring in uh, Winston. Win. Winston, so um, that last point of makes about, we were looking to see if the personality she brings to the speech because that is going to be important. Can she mobilize around that? That she galvanized you feel inspired listening to him? You know, what, what's, your, what's your take? I haven't listened to so, her. You know, you know, Evans, uh, before she spoke, I said that sometimes the longer you last on the campaign platform, the mistakes you make, mm. the shorter you stay there, the better. Her very first five to 10 minutes were instructive. When she got into the long you know, bit about where she's come from, she was trying to connect with everybody to say, I am one of you, I have been there with you, and I know how it feels and all of that. But she spoke too much, it got to a point, we just don't, didn't remember what she was saying again. Mm. And so one of the things I said when I was listening to John Mahama, say all the things, was more of giving us an idea why he chose her. And I said to myself, these are things Nana Jane should be saying, unless she has more to say. It turned out, that John Mahama said too many things which Nana Jane should have been the one saying, okay. particularly because today John Mahama says it's her day. It is true John Mahama would be on the ballot, but it's also true that if you want to send the signal, right signal, about the person you're bringing on board, if you want to say, if you want to communicate that I am with her, it's her. So that everybody takes her on. I mean, you've talked about uh, it's him, not her, mm -hmm. also trending. Yeah. I'm sure if I will get to that. Mm -hmm. How the ruling party or the governing party is doing everything possible to direct attention to John Mahama. Mm -hmm. If the NDC sought to fight that, I think they did themselves a great disservice by making John Mahama speak too much when this was supposed to be known as... You raise an important point. In fact, when we were crafting this show, yeah. we, talk, we called it the Jane, the ticket, solving the Jane and John puzzle. Yeah. And there are many people who said, ah, why Jane and John? Why not John and Jane? And then I make the point to them, we took a cue from the party. If you look at the picture that we've been using, it is a, an official party picture of Professor Jane Opokwajiman in front of John Mahama. Exactly. Right? And so you thought, okay, now they're putting her... In the, line, in the front line, and John Hama is going to be behind. Of course, we know who the candidate is. Yeah. So you, you, what your point you're making is that they should have, that should have reflected in the event. Exactly. So John Hama should have been um, less de-emphasized. De de yeah. And then emphasize 
and subscribe. But even they do that. I mean, she spoke the longest, no, I thought. Well, but you see, you see, uh, Evan, she spoke the longest. But let's put this to test. What did she say? What did John Mahama say? Okay, the, the, you're, not, you're talking about the content. Yeah. The content. Okay. You see, John Mahama was more substantive policy. Good. But you see, okay. when John Mahama says, I don't want to say much because she has a lot to say. But she said, but he said all. Oh. That's the whole okay, point. Okay, I get your point. And so, and so for me, for me, I mean, she spoke very well. And for those of us who like a lot of argument, you know, you would want to listen to the end. You get to enjoy the conversation. It reminded me of, uh, you know, my lecture rooms at the University of Cape Coast. But hey, there's a political well, platform. Quickly, what was the biggest takeaway for you from what she said? Well, um, it was, first of all, it was about, um, you know, what this meant for women and the youth. The youth okay. policy for me was great. The four points that she put out there was great. One thing also, she tried as much as possible to remember all of us, her backgrounds. Mm. That is key. And that would, you know, give credence to the point you made earlier. About the grassroots About connection. the grassroots bit. That despite the fact that the national chairman says she's been brought in for the middle class, you also can't write off totally the importance of the grassroots. So she tries to connect with everybody. That's good. She does very well with that. But keep it short. Let us leave with so many takeaways. Yeah. Let us not leave struggling to remember. That, that what point you, you made about trying to get us to see her as I'm one of you. Yeah. I remember there's a part that she says, I want to be sitting with you by the roadside, Thank by you. the farms, yeah. in the marketplace, in your offices, uh, you know, like all the, you know, the places that you, you don't think that a professor will go to. Yeah. She says, I want to be there with you. But then there's COVID. And so we'll find a way around it. And she kept on emphasizing her, her very humble beginnings. I mean, the people in Commenda, he, he talks about, you know, the, the folks, the, you know, some, some woman, an Alavanyo. You know, yeah. that, you know, and then she spoke some ever there. Her, her day, you know, exactly. I don't know what she meant by that, but I, I mean, if I can tell, yeah, I can rest tell in her. Peace. Rest <laughs> in, exactly. You know what I mean? I mean, she, uh, she wanted to stress the point, and I made this point. I made this note. She wanted to stress the point that I am one of you. And she was alert to who, what the NDC is, and as a party. And so I'm one of you. Could you what's, what's your take? Well, I think that somebody messed up. Okay. You know, Professor Nana Jeno Pukwajiman's address in itself was beautifully delivered. Mm. I think she spoke, she, she walked through the language in, in beautifully, effortlessly, as you would expect of an English professor. But somebody messed up the communication mm. and gave the nation the impression that she was coming to give a policy statement. Good point. But in reality, what she had prepared herself to do... It was an official do, statement to yes. announce the event. But in reality, what she had prepared herself to do was to come and endear herself to the nation in her very first mm. address. That was her plan. And if we had understood that to be her intention, we would have marked her 10 over 10. Mm. Because she did that. You're right, you've given all the examples of the ways in which she sought to endear herself, to relate to, to the Ghanaian, the typical Ghanaian, wherever you may be, whoever you may be. And she spared a thought for everybody. So if we had understood that she was not coming to announce any policy, she was simply coming to introduce herself mm. to the electorate, we would have marked her 10 over 10. But somebody said she was coming to give policy, uh, a policy statement. Mm -hmm. And John Mahama did that instead. So this is where our confusion Mm. is now birthed. Mm. Now, this is a mistake they can't afford to keep repeating because this is somebody who is introducing herself. You could even tell that there were a bit of nerves at the beginning. These are all expected, yeah. by the way. It's not unusual. It's your very first time on this national mm. stage. Yeah. So the expectation and, and, and struggle is... With the, with the teleprompter, you could see... Yes, you know, at the point she had, thing, to, yeah. she had to uh, rely on her notes. So these are normal. But because of the initial miscommunication, it has created a situation where we are now all a little bit confused about what we've just observed. And yes, indeed, I agree, it went on for quite a while. But if we had known from the very beginning what to expect, that she was going to spend time touching on everybody and everything, we would have settled into it and probably enjoyed it even more than we did. Mm. One more thing, uh, and I think it's true that when you're not a politician yet, it shows. At a point, she said that 
she was encouraging everybody to follow the government protocols. Mm -hmm. Follow what the government is telling us to do about COVID-19. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but there is a better way of saying it. Mm -hmm. You could have said, follow what the Ghana Health Service is telling us. Follow what the health professionals are telling us. But she chose to say, follow what the government is telling us. And there is a political connotation to that, which I'm sure she would have preferred to avoid. Okay. But all in all, good start. Okay. MFR, let's uh, do some of the messages that we are getting from social media now. Um, a lot of it. So let's go through them. Interesting uh, messages. Um, I'm sure we'll go on uh, Facebook. If I, my screen is um, available now, we'll just go on social media now. Um, some of the messages uh, that are coming in. Okay, so we're on Facebook, and uh, this one from Patrick Reed, who says there's no puzzle here. It's an open book, uh, because we had mentioned that we are solving the puzzle. So we'll go down more uh, to some of uh, the messages uh, that are coming. So this one from uh, Fie Emmanuel Gutzman says, uh, GO1, our Doreen Minister for Can Constellation Affairs, who will not witness any dead goods syndrome, okay? Uh, so Nana Say says, why is the former president always hiding at the back? Of his running mate, I don't understand. You tried uh, talking about that earlier. Kwesi uh, Nobel says they will collapse our education sector. Kwesi Apiakubi says tell him to stop hiding at the back of uh, the woman. Is, uh, is he afraid to be the flag bearer? Pakwesi says the hype around her is dead and no one can resurrect. Uh, and it's him, not her. That hashtag is trending yeah, on trending, Twitter yeah. as well. And this one from Nane Kya Fodjo says, hey, Ghana party. Is it by force for GM to smile? Jesus is Lord. Okay. So uh, these are comments uh, that have come up when we put up the, the artwork, the ticket solving mm -hmm. the Jane and uh, Jane puzzle. So we go on Twitter now. Uh, it's trending number one. Uh, Jane oh, and okay. Jane, 2020. Okay. Finally. Uh, yes, it's trending. And then the, it's him, not here, is also at number three. And John Mahama is also trending at number five. Mm. So that's what the Twitter trends uh, looks like uh, at this point. We'll take some of the comments uh, on the it's him, not here, and then also uh, the Jane and uh, GM and GM uh, 2020. So NBC official Ghana starts it. Okay, but we'll go down. Uh, so Mr. Dumelo, oh, John, John Dumelo has been tweeting. tweeting. He says, proud to be part of this historic moment. Hashtag GM and GM 2020. And Samuel Black, of course, the, the deputy, he was uh, the deputy education minister when Jane uh, was the education minister. No, He's no, also no, been tweeting. Uh, uh, no can social distancing there. Can I ask you a question, <laughs> MFA? Yes, what about her look, though? I, what she wore today. I, it's something that we've been talking about. <laughs> and uh, it's beautiful. I, I, classy. She's just there. This is uh, the quality of uh, Iran I should say. She's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. okay. Resplendent. <laughs> I haven't seen her look this beautiful before. Yeah, Fantastic. really. Like, she's beautiful. But this, hey, gentlemen, is, don't say this is a style I'm going to copy. It's a style I'm going to copy. Oh, yeah, going to copy that style. Yes, there's a part <laughs> that uh, we can say right now. Uh, we've been talking <laughs> about it with the boys. Now, this is one now. Momolati says minimum 30% of all appointments in the next John Mahama government. No, that, that, that thing is fact-checked because in 2012 the 2012 manifesto of the NDC yes they said that they, will, they, they said they put the target 40 percent 40 percent now it's been four years to implement mm -hmm. that it didn't happen what did he do it didn't happen in 2020 he's now he moved the, the target 40 of 40 percent to 30, to 30. Exactly. that is something that going for from tomorrow we need to a lot look of scrutiny at. is going to come on to exactly. that exactly now mm -hmm. Felix has also been tweeting on that and then uh, we are the revolution I think this is Eddie Magbana such an excellently Organized event, a party ready and organized for power. Some of the messages, um, a lot of them. Yeah. And um, all eyes have been on the election headquarters uh, tonight, huh? uh, on Facebook, everywhere. Uh, they've been watching and listening to the analysis. People have been tweeting about Winston and the rest of you. Well, um, the thank analysis. you, MFA. Thank you, Kojo. Thank you, Winston. Kojo and Winston, I don't envy you. We're going to be on the morning show tomorrow <laughs> with all this again. <laughs> this is PM Express. When I return, I'm going to be joined by. Um, uh, a, a political marketing analyst. We're going to go live to the ground where Araba Kumsi and Parker are standing by with some live reactions for you also. Stay with me because PM Express is live right after this quick break.
Ajima is a new benchmark. Oh yeah, Vice President, you know, okay, you know, Arba Yagana, or man, in this woman capable of being described as the president of the republic is one of the most disgraceful comments by the majority leader in parliament a track record as minister of education necessarily will become the other side of the coin she's sitting atop an organization which is not very friendly to women we're not choosing her just because she's a woman there's a lot that she's done to be worthy of being nominated it's your integrity that earned you this position it wasn't the size of any gun or the size of your account. We will justify the confidence we report to us and by God's grace we shall succeed. So of course the Jane and John puzzle I think for now you probably should have your own understanding of what the pieces are to this particular jigsaw and to this particular puzzle. I guess the missing link has not been provided by the woman herself, uh, Professor Jane uh, Nanopoko Ajiman. I want to bring in uh, Dr. Kobi Mensa with the University of Ghana Business School, political uh, marketing strategist, who joins us uh, live via Zoom right now. Prof, I'm pretty sure you followed the, the, her speech um, and the event itself. Your, your reaction? Thank you, Evans, and thanks for having me. Well, let me say that I'm not prof yet. Thanks for that. Oh, but I'm sure very soon. <laughs> yes, that yes, yes, yes. Very soon, yes. <laughs> okay, yes. I think that yes, uh, we have been following you know uh, the the campaign. Obviously, today's speech. Uh, obviously, uh, from the day that you know John actually announced her candidacy, uh, we have been following it. Uh, quite a lot of people have been following. Those who are political and apolitical have been following the conversation. Now, if you listen to her, which I think today a majority of us had opportunity to listen to her extensively, perhaps you would actually understand the diversity question that NDC had actually you know, been putting across, saying that they have actually been the forefront, at the forefront of diversity, at the forefront of inclusion. And suddenly her, you know, uh, what was speech today actually marked the scope or some scope of the campaign's message and you could actually see that you know from the kind of you know utterances from the sentences some of the you know phrases or some of the you know key issues that she actually highlighted so certainly it's been somehow i, I should say that it's been very exciting watching i'm not sure though that it was too lengthy because you know that the expectation of of her by people you know and and as a result she needed to actually speak at that length so that people can actually evaluate her from the perspectives that they want to see whether she merits the ticket or not. So let's let's start from the soft sides before we come to the substance, right? I mean, because you're a political marketing uh, person, let's start from the soft side. Yeah. One of the key things that she had to do um, and going into an election is mm -hmm. must inspire, must galvanize, etc. that you look at. You watch her, did she do that for you? Did she come across as somebody who has what it takes to stand by herself on a campaign platform and connect to people and convince them about the party's message? Correct. I mean, she does that in, in a various ways. First of all, if you look at the way she was swinging, I mean, when she came to the podium, I think the beginning, the takeoff, which is expected of everyone, especially in her position, and I haven't been named you know, historically as one of the, you know, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, female that could actually occupy the highest office in this country. You know, you could see the tempo. She took some time to actually, you know, uh, raise the game to the level that she did. And I think that towards the end, rather, you saw a very, you know, a, a post, I mean, a, a, a very well-composed, you know, candidate. And so you realize that from the beginning, she was a little bit mild, and then she went into a very, you know, tough-looking, tough-sounding in a position. So if you thought that she was, Obviously, her demeanor actually shows a very you know, calm person. But of course, in the delivery, in the oratory, you could see the other side of her. That actually brings in the diversity in terms of you know, her composure, in terms of her demeanor as well. So I think that it was good to demonstrate that aspect because obviously people thought that perhaps she could be a walk in the park uh, when it comes to, obviously, comparison with Baumia. But I think Baumia would definitely have a run for his money. And uh, looking at the way that she actually transitioned 
from a very, you know, a, a, a very calm position into a very high tempo uh, delivery. So certainly she actually brought that. And then secondly, you look at the the the, the attire, I mean, the, the dress, you know, coat that she actually put on, completely connected and actually moving her from the professorial look that you would expect her to, to be. Obviously, if you look at her composure right from day one, she hadn't actually looked your quintessential professor. So mm -hmm. definitely connection with the ordinary people, with the ordinariness as she speaks about with the diversity or the diverse you know, population or the diverse demographic that she speaks about. Certainly her outfit actually connects that as well. And then, of course, if you listen to some of the word choices, at some point, she's actually bringing a game to the MPP, actually talking about ex exceptionalism mm -hmm. would not be tolerated, talking about people's, everybody's grandparent or great grand, everybody's you know, uh, descendants uh, or what do you call ancestors have actually contributed to the Ghana that we have. And talking about the artificial borders that had already been created by the Europeans and the deepening of that border, uh, uh, the artificial borders and the worrying aspect of that. Yeah. Um, and I, yes, I think maybe having a challenge. Yes, Doc, please proceed. I think we lost you briefly, but yeah, proceed. Yeah. So I was saying that uh, in terms of her connecting with the with the audience, mm. you could you could actually see that from very many you know uh, angles, from the speech, from her you know uh, I, I mean from her uh, words, the, the the attire that she put on, and certainly from her composure and the delivery of a, of a, of a speech was was definitely connecting in very many points that we are talking about. I mean, uh, the, you you bring up the sector of Baumia. And then you say that he would give Baumia a run for, for his money. That, that, I guess, is a big one. I mean, um, Baumia, yeah. the current manifestation of Baumia, Dr. Baumia that we know, has been the creation of, what, eight, eight, plus, eight plus years, from 2008, 12, 16. Of course, I mean, quite, quite, it's taken him more than a decade to build this persona. Mm. You're saying that Professor J Nano Jinopokwajiman in the last few weeks, um, you watch it today, and he could, she could give Baumia a run for his, his, his money. Certainly, certainly. You know, uh, don't forget, you know, Evans, that she's a professor. I mean, she's in the classrooms, and as you know, one of your panelists was talking about, it's as if she was speaking to a student, which I disagree because I think that it's natural for uh, you know uh, people who are actually at the forefront of speaking engagement. You included people who actually I, I call them talking industry mm -hmm. there's a possibility of bringing that your your you know oratory power you know on the stage when you take the stage so don't forget although there is no app apprenticeship for presidency she's been a professor she's been presenting at you know uh, what you call conferences she's been presented every day in the classrooms so certainly she's going to have that flair whereas baumier's role in the past uh, without you know the political you know, angle of it. Obviously, it is not as extensive, although she, he's also been a, a lecturer before, it's not as extensive as, you know, Professor Nana Jane, you know, uh, experiences. So certainly, she's going to give Baumia, uh, Baumia, you know, a run for his money. I mean, if you look at the way Baumia actually, you know, delivers and throw punches, which in many ways, if you look at how John Mahama and Emisata actually responded to that, in a very calm manner, and uh, if, if you listen to uh, what called uh, uh, President, former President, you know John Mahama's uh, oratory style, he's always linear. But mm -hmm. there's a contrast from you know Jane's uh, Professor Nana Jane's you know uh, approach. Mm -hmm. She she goes and then she actually peaks in terms of her tone and pace, mm -hmm. and that actually could actually give you that sense that she was not going to be that you know linear approach to accepting Baumia's kind of antics, you know, on, on the political platform. I don't think that's, that would be the case. And that's exactly what she yeah. demonstrated. Let, let, let's talk about coming into this. I mean, our analysis had said that one of the things that she would need to, yes, she's a professor, um, but, one of, but, but she's on a professor on the ticket of a party that is um, mass in its appeal, the NDC, and, and appeals to a certain class of people, right, mostly, uh, predominantly. And she would need to also show that she can connect to that base as a middle-class professor. And I saw her make references to her very humble beginnings. 
and how she want to sit with people on the streets, in their farms, in their homes. Did, you, did he convince you, if you were listening to her as a typical NDC grassroots supporter in a village somewhere across the, in, in, uh, in, in the hinterlands of the country, did she convince that, in fact, I am one of you, and I am, I am as NDC at heart and in reality as you are, and I identify with everything that you represent? Did he connect to that base? Did she connect yeah. to that base? Certainly. I mean, uh, Evans, if you look at her demeanor, for example, that I talked about her demeanor and her composure, she's no way, you know, coming across as your quintessential professor. I mean, by if, if you, even if you don't know her, and the first time that you, you see her, certainly she would not come across to you as a professor. So that's the first point of connection. And then the kind of, you know, uh, words that she uses, her language, you know, certainly the kind of language that she employed, whether be it because it's a political platform or not, the kind of language that she employs when she's speaking does not come across to you as a professor because, of course, she's a professor of English, but you find that she uses the very, you know, ordinary language, the very simplistic language that people can really appreciate and not to actually put her on that pedestal as a professor. And that's a very good thing for her to, to actually do that. Because as you said, you know, there was, a, there was a concern that she may not be able to connect to the grass, grassroots of the NDC party, which is very much, you know, not your typical, you know, intellectual base as people actually uh, argue, although it doesn't mean that there are no intellectuals in the party. I think she definitely does that job. And don't forget also about, you know, uh, the, the idea that she also comes across as somebody who is not a native politician. And when I say native politician, that is somebody who is not, you know, a, 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 what do you call it, your quintessential politician. She comes out as a very ordinary individual that is actually addressing, you know, uh, what do you call people. So I think that these characteristics actually go, go on to actually connect to the party base, but also broadly to connect to the voters you know, uh, of this country. So I think that she, she does really well on that grounds. Okay. Of course, what people were really looking at is whether she would have that, you know, uh, the, the oratory power to actually connect to almost everyone in terms of you know, raising the, the, the campaign tempo. And in terms of, you know, calming where it is necessary, I think that the delivery today actually, you know, kind of touched on these points for me. And I think that it's a good thing that she had actually, you know, demonstrated that, that yeah. ability. Let, let's talk about the substance of what she said. So we've dealt with this was fun. Did she convince you on substance? I mean, we know she's a professor, right? I mean, but, mm -hmm. and she makes the point, this is a campaign that will be run on track record. And she herself has a track record in, as education minister. But the man whose face is going to be on the ticket, Joe Mama, has a track record as well. Now, in delivering the policy, mm -hmm. um, I mean, first of all, that quick comment about uh, that she was supposed to be delivered a policy statement. And yet, did you see her do that? Or Joe Mama took that shine? Well, I don't think that it, he, she came across as announcing policy, which I thought if she had done that, it would be a mistake because don't forget, people have actually been questioning why, you know, uh, it looks as though the campaign is making as though she's the one leading the ticket. And so any policy announcement must come from the ticket, the head of the ticket, not the, the deputy or not the, the, the second on the ballot. So certainly she didn't do that. Now, whether she actually marked the scope of the campaign message, and I think she did. Uh, because the idea that, you know, uh, some exceptionalism in the system, some are actually being called citizens and some are not being called citizens, the idea that everybody's, you know, uh, what do you call, great grants or ancestors have contributed to this guy and therefore everyone is important. These are key campaign messages going forward, I think, from NDC's in a corner. You're going to hear a lot about these and perhaps her candidacy is actually being defined within that frame, going beyond you know, the gender question or the demographic questions, but you know, looking at a broader campaign messaging question, which she actually defined that in her presentation, you know, the kind of thing that she said. So for me, I think that yes, uh, if she had done the policy announcement, it would have been a mistake because it would have actually kind of uh, connected to the criticisms 
that already the campaign is having that she, she, she's actually leading. And by the way, I don't think that the picture, the campaign you know, uh, uh, image where she's actually leading is really you know, a, a, a bad thing per se. I think that people are mis misconstruing that or miscalculating that because if you look at most of the, you know, uh, what do you call, photos of men and women, especially partners, which in this case, they are not necessarily partners, but they're partners for a political you know, uh, positioning. It's always about the females leading and then the male actually behind. And most of the social pictures, you know, if you look at it, majority of it, that is the, the arrangement. Yeah. So being a candidate, being a candidate and being at the back of her instead of being in front, I think it sits with our culture, yeah. social culture. It does. I mean, and, and don't we, don't don't we, people... don't we always say ladies first? I mean, we always say ladies that's first. Right. I mean, I guess that is playing into that. But I'm grateful, um, Dr. Uh, Kobe Mensa there, of course, uh, joining us with this analysis. And this is just a tip of the iceberg. There's a lot to analyze and unpack. And I'm sure tomorrow we stay with us here on election headquarters. We'll bring you more of this. My name is Evans Mensa. Enjoy the rest of your evening.